so hi everybody again. Uh, I have no idea. It's like it's like being in the universe without any grounding when I can't see or hear anything, but I am here and I am certain this is working. Um, I want to introduce uh, Nadine Green to you today. Uh, she is our special guest and she is the the vision uh, behind uh, a different kind of sheltering and a different um, philosophy that is centered around compassion. And if it wasn't for her relationship with Ron that evolved and developed when she was experiencing eviction from her store, then uh, we probably wouldn't be all sitting here today having this conversation. So I really just want to really thank and uh, thank Ron for everything that he did, but also to uh, really acknowledge that the vision and the feeling that comes with this woman is amazing. And the minute I met her, it was like, wow, this is a, this is a human who isn't just, she doesn't just speak about compassion. She lives it every day. And because she has that lived experience, she embodies that belief system and that spirit that, uh, that things have evolved at a better tent city. And it's not easy. There's nothing easy about being homeless. And it's very rare that somebody is choosing complete homelessness without shelter. So I just want to say that uh, Nadine is the on-site coordinator for A Better Tent City at Lot 42. Uh, she was a variety store owner in downtown Kitchener who transformed her store into a makeshift shelter for people who were being forced to sleep rough on the streets and ha who had absolutely nowhere to go. As a result of being evicted from her store on Water Street, she met Ron Doyle and Jeff Wilmer. And I believe Jeff is here today. Uh, Good to see you, Jeff. Uh, as it turned out, they were working on a project to develop tiny homes to help address the ever-growing homeless situation in the region of Waterloo. And through their conversations after Nadine's eviction, uh, when COVID hit, Ron offered his property at 41 Ardelt Place as a haven for the homeless. If Nadine agreed to live on site, it had to be that she was gonna live on site, and if she agreed to coordinate the project, so I'll let her tell you what she said to him. Uh, she actually lives in her own tiny house at Lot 42 and she loves it from what I understand. Uh, but her sleep can be short because after her eviction, she took her store on the road uh, for her homeless friends in the region and those who now have housing but are struggling to afford rent and, uh, and to have food actually at the same time. She's a graduate of Galt Collegiate Institute in Cambridge. Uh, Nadine uh, moved to this region from Jamaica in 1984, which was the year that I went away to university. Her favorite song, of course, is One Love by Bob Marley. Not only does she like the song, she actually lives it every day through several acts of compassion regularly and she says and tells me that she couldn't be happier. So I'm just wondering if Nadine would like to uh, put on her uh, her camera. Yay. <laughs> hey. And I'm going to assume, unless somebody tells me different, that we're on the, the uh, switch between us kind of thing. So this is awesome. I see you. Yay. Hi, everybody. And hi, Nadine. Hi. Hi, Heather, how are you? Good. I'm in my tiny house. I see this. <laughs> it's so, crowded, but it's okay. <laughs> well, it's because it's tiny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to get comfortable because I'm always really comfortable when I come to your tiny house, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, it's got such a great feeling about it. It's like, ah, oh, this is like so pleasant and peaceful and all of those things. <laughs> so um, I want you to tell people about when you met Ron and how this all kind of transpired. Give us the short version because we only have half an hour, so the quickie, but you know, the main points. So short one. So I met Ron when I was um, 
almost getting evicted from my store. He heard about me through a couple of homeless people that went to a council meeting. And I guess he came over my store. He tried to find me. I wasn't there at the time. And he came a couple of times and I was sleeping in this little cubby hole that Alvin O'Day, my assistant here now, made for me. And I came out, I pulled the curtains and I came out and he was like, this is amazing. This is magical. At first I'm like, who's this guy? Because <laughs> I heard from other people when I was running the shelter, oh, you're stupid. Why are you helping these people? You're going to lose your store. Like you lost everything. And hearing Ron Doyle coming in and say, this is amazing. <laughs> this is magical. Like, I, like it gave me hope knowing that what I was doing was, was okay. Well, I knew what I was doing was okay to me, but hearing it from another person, point of view. And then he came back a couple of times. I think he brought Jeff and he brought right. some other friends with him. He, like he just kept coming in and he would hang out with the guys and just kept talking and just giving me praises. And we just became instant friends, best friends. That's and, so lovely. Uh, when something like that can happen out of a situation where systems are playing against each other in a way that, that leaves you caught in the middle, uh, in a way where, and where people are sleeping rough on the street. Um, the fact that all of the synergy happened was amazing. It was awesome. It, oh, yes. Yes, it was amazing. And, you know, Ron is just... And he just had plans, he was, and we would be on the phone every day, even before Lot 42 came about. He would just call me and see how things are going, asking me if I needed anything. I, like, I wouldn't ask for anything because I don't want to be asked. Like, I was always gracious, but he would send his friends over. This one lady came by, Linda, she would come bring coats and stuff. And I believe it was Ron telling her to drop by with stuff. He would just come bring stuff. Mm. Hey, can you tell me how compassion plays out at uh, a better Ted City? Like, what are what are some what are some times when you choose that compassion? Because I know, like the like the one ingredient that's missing with most of the homeless people is love, compassion. When they stay in the shelter, they're being kicked out. Get out! It's always get out. And even when they were downtown, it's do not sit here. Like they took away the benches from downtown. There's no, they, they didn't want nobody sitting down. Homeless people. And here, like we just, like I give love, compassion. Whenever I see somebody walking through the hallways, I always call them by their name. Like I would say, hello, Rob. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Zoe. You know, always call people by their name. How are you today? And I would always say like, I love you, you're so amazing. And I don't just say it like I mean it, you know, cause they are amazing. I don't know. <laughs> what else Why are they amazing? Them? What What's so amazing about them? Because I think if you can make it outside one day and live out rough, then you are amazing. It's like, it's not easy to be homeless. And if you can make it out there one night, two nights, you're amazing. What would you say to people who have an issue with their taxes going to support initiatives that they don't agree with? Like, what do you think of that? What, what I would say to them is it doesn't matter where the money goes, you still have to pay the same amount of taxes. Whether the money's going to help homeless people or not, you still pay the same amount of taxes. So at least your taxes is going to help somebody. So I guess one of my that are on the street. So one of my big questions to you is because um, I think a lot of people are like, well, why can't they just go to the shelters? Like, why do we need why do we need these little houses? Like, why can't they just go to shelters? Because it's not everybody can make it in the shelter system. Like for instance. I don't know about now, but back then, if you stay at the House of Friendship, you had to be in by 12. A lot of people who experience homelessness maybe don't have a watch. They can't tell time. Sometimes they could be hanging out with friends. They don't want to go home at 12. So if you're not there by 12, then you're kicked out. And if you get into a fight because of your mental health issues, 
or your drug addiction, then you're kicked out. And with here at the lot 42, a better 10 C, people can fight if they want to, because because they're home and you fight in your house, same as other people. And you're not gonna get kicked out for that. So do you think that there's room for what you're creating inside uh, all of the other potential uh, ways that we can help people transition from being homeless if they if they have to go that far i still question why anybody's homeless but um if they need to transition back do you see how a tiny house can help someone do that what is it about a tiny house that can help because i live in one of the tiny homes um i love it it's like um small it's like a one room house it is a one room house i feel safe it's just cozy, it's like it's amazing. You will have to try to see. <laughs> like it's hard for me to explain, but I don't have to live here, but I am here and it's cozy. And if I can feel cozy, can you imagine somebody who has nowhere to go? How, how you feel being in your tiny house? You know, it's just amazing. I think everything is amazing. <laughs> it's, just... it's true, it's true. You mean it. Yeah. And there's a difference. Yes. Um, have you had to deal with drug overdoses? We've had one. Uh, we've had one person passed away here last year. It was very sad, and uh, we have a couple overdose, but nothing um, fatal. And we try to watch people, and we're like we're family here, so people will look out for each other, and we're just close. We're like we're just a family. Like it's hard to explain. We're just one big family here at Lot Forty Two. I'm better to see. You know, it's funny because you always thank you, Ron Doyle. <laughs> you always say that it's hard to explain. And yet, when you talk about what that compassion means, when you a lot of times we will, if somebody is doing something that isn't considered normative or isn't considered appropriate or with the manners that we like, or they trigger us into fear. Like that can happen as well. How do you handle those situations? What is it that you do that helps restore relationships and peace? Well, say here, like if somebody's being away, which we don't think anything is abnormal here, is you know, but if somebody's being like for instance, the only rule that we have here is no one is allowed to have a cigarette inside the common area. So I would come home or if I'm inside, I'll catch somebody with a cigarette. Mm -hmm. And I would say like, say for instance, it's Carl. And I would say, Carl, Carl, Carl. And he's like, I'm sorry, Nidhi. <laughs> and he'll run outside with the, with the um, cigarette or I'll just take it from their hand and just put it outside. Oh, someone's <laughs> visiting. We, all, we, no said we, gonna, we said that sorry. we were gonna do this. Uh, this today <laughs> that we were going to allow people to just be and mm -hmm. so Nikki may have some people come in and chat uh same thing will probably happen <laughs> with laura as well and uh, yeah. alvin's alvin's it's hanging out oh like you want to say hello alvin yeah hello Hey, Alvin. Hey, how you doing? Sorry about the hair. Oh, no <laughs> worries. Windy out. I think we have clean <laughs> hair now. Yeah, pretty close, yeah. Um, when, when, when we get closer to the question and answers where people can ask lots of questions and stuff, um, I'm hoping that you'll be hanging around sort of close by. Yeah. Great. Because that way, um, oh, yeah. I know Jeff's on here as well as Laura. And okay. questions about how things function, or don't function and needs and that sort of thing, then uh, then we can have we can talk to you guys as well. So, hey. um, Nadine, I wanted to get back to that idea of compassion. Like two people are fighting or something. Like what is it that's different? Because I mean, most of the people I've talked to uh, at a better tent city at different times were like, yeah, they couldn't go back to shelters. So. And how does that relate to the idea that housing is a human right? 
Um, so here, like if someone gets, gets into a fight, if the fight is really bad, then I'll ask, do you want me to call the police? And if somebody say yes, then I'll call the police. And uh, one person here was charged one time with a fight. After the fight, the police um, brought them to the station and, and they came back home. Because you're always welcome back home. Right. It's always home, home, home. And so we do that. We don't like we, we try not to kick anybody out. We only had to kick out one guy here and it was really bad. And it broke my heart. And mm. I told him, um, his name is Joseph. I said, Joseph, I love you so much, but you cannot stay here. And he knew that. And it broke my heart. Like I cried when he had to leave. But I just know that he couldn't stay. I said, I love you so much, but you can't stay. It's just not, you know, it's not good for the people. I have the method all by waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Sorry, I'll be just laughing. No, that's, that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's not, it's not always easy. No, it's not. And uh, right. that's part of, I guess, one size doesn't always fit all. And yeah. one place yeah. isn't. No one solution is going to deal with a housing crisis. It's, it's really that we need all those different places. And, uh, and having that opportunity to be able to have enough safety and enough protection, at least the things that you still own, um, to me seems to be worth its weight in gold. Um, it is. So what's going to happen? Uh, do you know now that Ron has passed and has, do you know where you're going to be moving yet? I am not sure yet, but I never worry about stuff because I know that like, even when I was being kicked out of my store, it was so weird. I was just, they, they threw my stuff in the garbage. They did so much awful things. And I said, God, something big is coming because I knew I wasn't doing anything wrong. <laughs> and I'm like, Lord, what is happening? You know? And so with, with Ron's passing, I know something big is coming and something better maybe is coming. And I just never worry. I just don't worry about stuff. I put it in God's hands. If there was something you could tell uh, the region or the city, um, mostly the region, because I think it's the region that handles housing. Um, actually, if there's one thing you could tell the region um, that has to do with housing, what would that be? I would tell them to get more tiny homes for, for people that the, the system cannot handle and just let them live their life on their own terms. Because if they get that opportunity and that chance to, to own a home, don't care how small it is to own a tiny home, maybe they will change to, mm -hmm. to the other people's eyes. But to me, they're wonderful. Like it doesn't matter if they're bad or not, they're just amazing. But if they make more tiny homes, just have a community of tiny homes and to let Ron, Ron Doe's legacy lives on. Nice. Is he like, he's really into the tiny homes, really into that. Um, if you now were to uh, talk to the city um, about public lands or anything like that, uh, would it be useful if tiny homes were able to access some form of public lands? It would be useful, yes, definitely, definitely. If they give us the land, we can use it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll use, we will use it up. Just get me and Jeff and whoever else is involved and we'll, we will use that land up for them. So the last thing I'm gonna mention before we go to the Q&A is I just wanted you to share, um, there was a woman, we won't name her, but she was amazing. And I remember her. Um, she was indigenous and she had a gift. Um, and it had to do with uh, when people were ODing, she had a real skill. Um, do you know who I'm talking about? Yes. I don't yes. want to say the name because we want to, mm. you know, but. Uh, protect the innocent. <laughs> protect the innocent. But yeah, what, what was her skill? So we, we, we had seven people that overdose here and she saved their lives. She would be over them, you know, administering Narcan, talking to them, bringing them back. And she saved seven people. Thanks to Kelly, actually. I met her through Kelly. 
I I went to where Kelly's workplace was and I met her and Kelly asked if if she could move into the lot 42. I said, sure. I always say yes right away <laughs> without, you know, <laughs> I say yes to everything. <laughs> Beautiful. And she moved in. And when I went to pick her up with her boyfriend, they were actually living in some woods, way deep in the woods. I went with my car, picked up their stuff. And I brought them to the lot and it was God's work and she saved seven people. And I'm happy I said yes. Amazing. It's nice to say yes sometimes. <laughs> I am happy I said yes to Ron, right? He <laughs> came with the idea and I'm like, yes, count me in. <laughs> okay, we're now, uh, we're gonna open up the discussion uh, with some, uh, with Q and A. Now, this is kind of weird because we're doing webinar, uh, which is different on Zoom than meeting. So we've been playing around with that. And I'm a newbie at Zoom, everybody. So I am going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Jeff and Laura and Alvin to actually uh, open up their cameras so we can see you. Yay. Hello, Jeff. I think Alvin is busy at the moment. Alvin's doing He's something. Out. Yeah. Yeah, he's doing something. That's something that happens a lot is I see because, Jeff. Right. And so mm -hmm. one of the things we wanted to make sure we did here was we have the flexibility to allow who can be here and who can't because they're dealing with something that's really important and more pressing um, to happen. So that's why we tag teamed a bit so we could allow enough mm -hmm. people to be here. And Laura, I know Laura's running around dealing with food. So she may not be here, but we do have Jeff. And Jeff is integral to this process because of his understanding of, of city processes and his love of tiny homes. And I think probably his love of you now. Um, <laughs> and, and I suspect a whole bunch of other things, but I don't know. So um, yeah, so if, uh, if you can say hi, Jeff, that would be phenomenal. Hello, everybody. <laughs> you can actually keep your uh, you can keep your camera on, and I think we we can we can be in gallery view or something, and that'll make it work nice or whatever. No, we don't want that gallery view. We want speaker, and we want just the three of us again. So um, so Jeff will bring his camera on. If there's any questions, he can uh, he can help with. And I see that there's some questions in Q and A. Uh, I don't know what they are, and I'm I'm going to uh, let Barb uh, break in if she has a good question. So I uh, so that's how we're going to handle this. So all of you attendees out there, um, if you've got questions, please write them in Q and A, and Barb will help. Now there's other people that are also have control of their cameras and their mics, and if they have a direct question they would like to ask, um, by all means, you can just put up your raise hand, which is at the bottom of your screen for most people on computer might be on the side or something or at the top or whatever if you're on a cell phone uh, but please put up your hand and we will uh, ensure that your questions ask directly okay it's barbara here you can hear me yeah great um first of all i'd like to share with you um a wonderful comment from kelly anthony Nadine and Ron were an unlikely team. A reminder that allies and supports can even come from the often vilified members of the privileged white male patriarchy. No one should be prejudged. One love, let's come together. <laughs> oh, Nadine, you <laughs> must love that. <laughs> I love that. Okay, I love you, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> I think she loves you. <laughs> First question from Lloyd Vandenberg. When Nadine is not there, does this little city go into chaos? <laughs> That's a good question. What happens when you're not there, Nadine? Sometimes it does. Go, <laughs> fights, fights break out. <laughs> and um, that's where Alvin comes in. Because Alvin is like the dad, I'm the mom. So whenever I'm not here, Alvin takes over. And when I'm not here, it's only for a short while, I'll go out and deliver meals to help the other people that are out on the street. And then I come home. Like I remember the one day I came home and the one guy, he was running, Blake, he's running inside. And I heard him say, mom is here, she's back. 
And when I walked in, everybody just sat down. <laughs> but he just ran as soon as I pulled up. She's here. She's here. <laughs> it was just funny. So it's interesting. So it is like a family. People have formed into like a, a family structure. Yeah. 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 And if yeah. I'm not here, maybe they're bad. And then they see me. He just went to warn everyone that I'm here. She's coming. You got to put out the cigarette because that's the one thing. I don't like is the cigarette or somebody smoking weed or just anything in right. the common area. So he just went to tell them she's coming. <laughs> which is uh, which is you know important. It's shared space and and making sure that that shared space is is good for everybody. So that makes sense yeah. to me. I sound so much more like I don't know than you do, which is great. <laughs> like it's like um, I'm hoping I'm hoping I'm a bit of a bridge uh, because. Um, I think it is hard um, for people who are used to a lot of structure to understand how this family is emerging and how it works. So if Alvin's not there, like say you have a crisis and you and Alvin aren't there, are there other people? Like, are there there's, other helpers? Or like, there's other people here, like uh, Ralph, he's older, and um, Bev. Yeah. She's, she's one of the seniors that live here. Okay. So, so they kind of step step into the role when we're not here, okay. and we try not to not be here often because it's just whenever I'm not here, I actually miss it. Like when I'm not at the lot, it's like, oh my god, I got to get home. <laughs> you know, I don't want to stay away for too long. I'm not ne never happy when I'm not here. Is the Better Tent City a shelter or a neighborhood? It's a neighborhood. Okay, Home. what does that mean to be a neighborhood? It's just like, it's like, a, I would call it like a, a, like a small street where all the neighbors know each other. You know, sometimes you'll see people come out of their houses, stand in front of another person's house and chit chat. Right. And sometimes I have my house, I have a step outside and everybody comes and sit on my bench. Even when I'm asleep, they come and they sit around and talk. So it's, you know, it's a neighborhood, homes. Now, do you think you need um, other supports? Like if you could have whatever you wanted to help with this, with this endeavor, with this neighborhood, what would, what would be the people and the, and, the, and the things that you would need? I know you already have a methadone clinic, which is awesome. And that is working out really well. What would be the other things that would, I mean, this is dreaming now, okay? A little dreaming, not like, you know, the biggest dreaming ever, but you know, the best case scenario, what would you have? I would need, we would need more um, music, music and more houses for people. Mm -hmm. Cause there are some people living inside waiting for houses. We have about 10, 20 people inside, maybe, 15 people and they're all waiting for a tiny home. So we need more houses. Got it. Oh, hey, uh, Laura. Laura's got her hand up, which means she wants to add something. <laughs> Go for it. Hi. Hi. Um, Hi, Laura. Hello. Sorry I'm late. <laughs> it's a food bank. Um, uh, I've spent some time talking to folks recently, and there's a few things that um, people would like if we could, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and in preparation for today, um, we know that um, the survey that our friends um, uh, at Sanguine did told us that we should have a landline, telephone line. We definitely need that. And okay. um, some more, um, uh, they are looking for um, outreach workers who might be dedicated to our space. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, some of them have the workers that have been with them for a long time, and those are great relationships. But there's folks with us who don't have workers. They're looking for peer support workers. Um, uh, they feel that um, folks who um, have lived experience, but who can also provide that, that navigational support, mm -hmm. um, and mental health practitioners and access to counseling. Um, a lot of folks are dealing with stuff that um, they've had trauma in the past and, and, uh, and uh, would love an opportunity to actually, now that they're settled and home, as Nadine said, this is their home, home. they want to uh, <laughs> have access to those kinds of supports. And certainly some people want to move on to other housing if it could be available, um, mm -hmm. but not into another shelter, but into, when we ask them about what their choices would be um, uh, into, you know, uh, 
of their own housing. Nice, interesting. Uh, we have somebody with their hand up. Hi, Tare. Would you uh, like to turn on your mic and your camera? I let everybody do their own thing. <laughs> I have the power. I actually have the power to mute you, and I can like take you, I can take you down visually. <laughs> I don't want to use it, right? Hi, Tare. Good morning. It's still morning. Yes, it is. <laughs> hi, hi, uh, hi, Nadine. How are you doing today? Hi. I'm doing great. <laughs> Good. Um, so I, I have two questions. Is that okay? Um, so one is what what's the demographic of Tent City? Like just just at a guess, um, uh, women, men, um, uh, different races, different. Um, uh, if, if anyone knows, like, are there trans people or queer or gay people who live there? Um, just kind of your best estimation. <laughs> and then the second mm -hmm. question is what cultural, um, I guess, programming um, has already been created by the, the, uh, the inhabitants of this wonderful neighborhood? Um, and uh, as a kind of addition to that question, um, what kind of cultural programming would would be best to support from people who don't live in tent city better tent so city. we so we have 20 um i think we have 20 ladies and 30 men and um we have um two blacks <laughs> me and diana we have about seven natives um and uh, i think the rest are white i hate to call out race, I, race. Yeah. It's, it feels awkward to do that i'm i'm sorry to, to put <laughs> no, that no, on no, you. no 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 it's fine it's fine because <laughs> i always hear people say she's not black it's nadine <laughs> you know yeah. it's weird but and um we don't really have any programs here as yet. Everybody just blend in and do their own thing. Um, I don't. I don't know if Laura or Laura could ha answer that question because she's always here. Okay. Um, but we don't really have any programs except no. for the methadone. Not yet. We have the methadone right now, right? Yeah. Yeah, methadone yeah. for sure. Um, in terms of cultural. Uh, programs, you know, I think um, we've been doing a lot of visioning about what next and, and what the future could hold. And it seems to me that we've taken the better part of this year to establish a community and um, to get, as they say, frameworks in place, right? We have um, systems mm -hmm. now to make sure that there's food so people can always make breakfast and lunch and dinner is always served, like prepared, not served, people help themselves. Um, mm -hmm. People are settling into their own homes. Um, but there hasn't been um, uh, programming. There are some um, faith communities that come out, but I think um, it would be um, really interesting to explore uh, with the Indigenous folks on site if they're at all interested in um, uh, uh, culturally based programming, that's cool. And, um, and also talking to other people about um, uh, uh, opportunities to express themselves artistically. Um, I thought it was really interesting when, um, when Ron passed away, um, we were collecting thoughts to share with his family. And um, one person said to me, I just wrote a poem for Ron. And he was quite choked up, someone I would not expect to be choked up. And he said, mm -hmm. I haven't written a poem in a long time. And mm -hmm. it felt really good. And um, so I think that Tara, um, you see. art is uh, uh, something that we should explore. And artistic expression is something we should explore. But, you know, that's, uh, we haven't had uh, the luxury of the time and energy to do that. And, and um, part of today, I think is, is um, a great opportunity to engage with the community to see what kinds of other resources, as people are getting vaccinated and feeling more comfortable about being out and, and, and safely together, you know, what we can do to support the community. Um, someone, um, uh, we were talking about, you know, what, what would it look like, you know, what could it look like going forward? Um, to our next location and what, you know, again, this imagining, right, which is such an important thing for folks to do about their future. And um, someone said a workshop, 
you know, we, we have tools, we need a safe place to keep them, we need a place where we can do work. Um, I can, you know, this person was saying, I can show people how to use these tools. And um, so I think that there's a lot of potential for that. Not that using tools is a culturally based program, but you know. I see Jeff, Jeff, ha Jeff is ready to speak. Thanks very much. I, I was just thinking about this, this question about the, how the community of people there is a family and how, how things sometimes uh, slide a little bit if Nadine is not present or if Alvin's not there. But, but it seems to me that the volunteers are also a big inf positive influence on the residents. Um, Laura is a good example of this uh, and the people who make evening meals that come to the, to the site. A, a lot of the volunteers are like grandparents, right? They're senior citizens. Um, but when they're there, the residents are very respectful of, of each other, of the environment, of the volunteers themselves. So it's like, yeah, if it's a family and the kids are getting unruly, but then company comes over, then everybody's on their best <laughs> behavior. So the fact that volunteers are, uh, and we re rely very heavily on volunteers, uh, there's such a presence of volunteers every day. I think that also helps to keep everybody grounded and remind them of, of what, it, what, it's, what it takes to be a good neighbor to each other. Because this truly is, this is a home, it's not a shelter. This is, people have their own house or their own tent, their home, but in a home that you share with other people, you know, that it, it, we, we all need to be reminded sometimes that uh, how to be respectful of our, of our roommates and our neighbors. I gotta tell you, it doesn't really sound that much different than cooperative housing. The rooms are just, or the, the apartments are a little smaller, but it feels in some ways like that. Um, and having been in co-op housing enough, um, I think it's, it, it makes total sense where, how it's evolving and organically growing. Um, I guess I have a question. I have, I have two questions. And if there's any other questions, Barb, from the, uh, from the chat or from the Q&A. Yeah, yeah, there are quite a few, actually, Heather. Perfect. I don't need to talk then. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, one from Lloyd Vandenberg. Would you recommend a city like this without a mom and dad idea? Hmm. I, um, I think it works better having somebody live here having a mom and dad it works a lot better with the people that have trauma and um, addiction issues and mental health issues if you don't have those issues then sure like you don't need a mom or dad right that, that's what i think so a replicating th th this is the thing that i find interesting is how do we replicate nadine and how do we replicate alvin because you two are deeply human special people would you train others? Would you, would we, would we learn how to, would we learn from this philosophy of compassion, the people that might be interested in living in a tent city? Like how would, how would we replicate? Yes, Laura. I, I, I don't think you could train someone to become a <laughs> <laughs> I'm training. We're different. Program to to conditional love or the ability to fix anything. Um, yeah. You know, uh, but I but I do think that there's some lessons too going forward. Again, talking to folks about what they want, um, and and now that things are more settled, I'm reminded of when I had kids and they said at the three month mark you have a settled baby that that's that stage, but things are more settled. Um, you know, um, uh, folks orient new people to the space. A lot of it happens informally. Um, you know, there's, there's patterns of behavior. There's, it, um, anyway, it's more settled. And, um, but increasingly when I was speaking with people in advance of today, they were saying what they were looking for is to get more engaged in some kind of collaborative governance structure. We've always said it's a self-governing community because Nadine um, is very open and talks to people. People are aware of sort of what the rules are and, and, and they know um, that, they, that, that basically the buck stops with her, right? She, they're the person to, she's the person to go to. And I don't think that should change, um, but I think people wanna, wanna become more engaged and are looking for, for opportunities to do that. And, um, and I think that's really interesting. Um, when I asked folks what, what's one of the things they really love about the plays, uh, the first answer for many people, well, they said the food was great, which 
is lovely to hear. <laughs> but um, they uh, also said the fact that there's no staff was like <laughs> fantastic because for folks who've been in the system, they always haven't, especially the ones who end up with us, haven't had the best relationships with staff. We'll leave it there. And when I asked them a little further along, um, you know, what would be helpful going forward and what could we, what could we do to make a better tent city better? It was get staff. So, <laughs> and, but the mm. getting staff, I think it's because nobody likes to clean toilets or wash dishes or scrub the floors mm -hmm. and they all do those things. And um, I don't think we'll stop having residents doing those things anytime soon, but it is interesting. Um, and uh, as, as people um, continue to want to become more involved, I think as we think about where we're going and how we get there uh, with respect to our future, um, self-governance is something we do need to, uh, to consider um, now that we are more settled. Does that answer that question somewhat, Barb? Oh, I would think so. Pretty fully, right. thank you. All right. uh, Darlene Francis is wondering if any children live at Lot 42. No, we don't have any children here. Okay. But the people who have children, sometimes they come and visit. But we don't have any kids here. We've also had a couple of questions about sexual assault. Is this an issue and how do you protect people from it? It's nothing that we're aware of, but if somebody has a problem, they could come to me, Alvin or Laura, who's always on site most times, and we will call the police if anything, if, if there's a problem like sexual assault. Okay. Yes. Another so, question. Um, oh, Laura wanted yeah. to address something there. Sorry. Yeah. No worries. I, I did ask folks again um, if they felt safe. Everyone I asked said they did, which was interesting. Um, they feel safe there. Um, and there are, of course, rules that, that we may not fully understand, you know, that are culturally based. Who knows? Um, but they say, you know, you, you know what to do and how to behave, and then you feel safe. So um, I didn't. I didn't, I have not heard, and there may have been people who were with us in the past who didn't feel safe and left. I can't speak to that, but certainly people who are there now feel safe. But that's part of the fluidity, isn't it? That, that it's a neighborhood. And because it's a neighborhood, people come, people go. People make mistakes, people act out, people, people do things just like they do in houses. And I think that's one mm -hmm. of the really interesting things is is because uh, the sexual assault question often comes up. And um, I believe that sexual assault happens in all uh, stratums of society. Um, but anybody who uh, is, is uh, in a lower, often a lower class, that can be dependent on many factors, including racialized, including poverty, many other things. We often come into contact with some form of social service uh, more often than say somebody who has other protections, but it's, it's always good to know, right? No matter what neighborhood you in, there could be somebody sexually assaulting someone. Yes. Yes, Barb. Okay. Uh, a related question. Is there any, uh, security for the neighborhood other than what you've described? We don't, <laughs> we have a, uh, I, Go ahead. I don't want to answer Go this way. <laughs> we have a couple guys who used to be bullies here when they've changed because, you know, I had a nice talk with them. So they kind of look out if somebody tries to come here. So they turn their bullying into security, kind of security. You know what I mean, Laura? Yeah. What I mean? So they turn so that we don't, desire or that need to protect usually because bullying is often not always but often about protecting yourself in sure, some way yeah. they turn that out to protect the entire community without being overt into somebody else's space is yeah. does that make sense what i'm saying yeah because the, you know a couple of guys who were bullies here i said we are a family why are we fighting with each other we're a family here we are the lot 42 family a better 10 city and so now they use that negative energy into if somebody comes on the lot, they probably say, who are you? Can I help you? So, but apart from that, we don't have security. So you don't hire guards? You don't have no, guns? Don't. None of that stuff? No, no. Like we're open, like, we're, no, like we don't have security. Because most times in the other shelters, the 
security guards har harass the homeless like the residents. So we don't want that here. It's an interesting, security is an interesting phenomena um, because it's very interesting about how we manifest our own feelings of insecurity uh, and how that can manifest in a sociological way for lack of a better word. Um, so it's interesting that for some reason at a better tent city, you haven't needed security in the way that we think of, like if somebody's doing something wrong, that we, you know, we, we protect everybody else from that person, right? By, by throwing them onto the street. Um, so it's really, it's interesting. Barb, more questions. You bet. I can talk all day. <laughs> um, other than the one person who had to be kicked out, has there been much turnover with residents or do most people who come to the site, stay, and never leave. There's a couple people that came and left to move on to, um, but I don't know if it's a better place, but a couple of people that were here are living at the university dorm style apartment. And a couple of people, this one uh, lady that was here, she did move out into an apartment and she came back. It didn't work out. And um, we have, just a few people left. The rest are still here. Now, would that be normal flow to a degree? In the sense yeah. that some people coming, some people going? Yeah, uh, like it's just like, people. yeah, people coming and going, yeah. Yes, Barb. Mike Morris says, well said, Heather and Nadine. Um, it's a neighborhood. <laughs> If someone is interested in exploring moving to a better tent city, how would they go about it? Hmm. Well, we're full at the moment, but if somebody wants to visit, we have like a three days grace where somebody can come sleep on the couch, hang out, have some food, and then we can help them find a place, whether at the House of Friendship, Mary's Place, or a room somewhere, but we are full at the moment. There's something amazing about this because I see an ecosystem versus a uh, one size fits all. What I'm seeing is that there's, you know, like I got a size seven foot, somebody else has a size 11 foot. Um, and sometimes, you know, you, sometimes you're one size a foot and then, you know, you have babies and stuff and then you get bigger feet. But what I'm trying to say is that life shifts and changes as well. So somebody may move to a better tent city for an, a time in their life and then move on. And somebody else may, this may be where they feel secure. Um, Jeff, you, you have a look that says you have something deep to say, actually. Don't I always have that look? You do, right? I here. guess not. No. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the, on that thought that not, not one size fits all and thinking back to the comment we were talking earlier that, that a better tent city is sort of a transitional step to help people get more stable so that they're ready for housing. I think a better tent city has caused us to look at the, the, at affordable housing and what it looks like differently, because I think the people that are thriving at a better tent city are doing well because of the family atmosphere and because they have a place of their own, but they also have a place they share with the others. And that if they each had their own studio apartment or, or one bedroom apartment, I think that would not be very effective for many of the people because um, it, the isolation would be really problematic and could cause them to fall back on old habits or, or old coping mechanisms that are that have been negative in their lives. So I think if we're looking at designing affordable housing, there's lessons learned from a better tent city as to what that can look like. It's some kind of a congregate setting where people have their own space, but there's shared space. That there's live-in care that's not an authority figure. It's not perceived as staff. It's perceived as your mom or your sister or, or your best friend. And, and that there's that kind of care and support to help everybody because we all need help at, at certain times. So I think there's a, there's a great opportunity here to help 
rethink and redesign what affordable housing with supports looks like and what a congregate setting looks like. Nice. Kathy, I've got a great follow on question from that. Kathy Kibble has been very patient waiting. Thank you, Kathy. With this question. What can you share about the requirements that you need when you're looking for a future location to move to? So this is very timely because we're certainly in that mode right now. Um, the most rare thing that, that uh, we've found is that Ron Doyle is one of a kind. Uh, when, when we started this, this uh, Better Tent City community almost a year ago, we had, we had two goals really. One was to help people who weren't already being helped and show that the model can work. And the second goal was to encourage that it be replicated. Originally, we were thinking 15 or 20 people is, is as big as we would want to get, but that we would then have, have another community of 15 or 20 people and another of 15 or 20, and then communities across Canada would, would copy this model. So we've certainly found that it works, and we've certainly found that we did not need to limit it to 20 people. It's working with 50 people, and there's some efficiency, a lot of efficiencies there too. But the idea of replicating it has come into a roadblock because there has not yet been another Ron Doyle step up. Somebody who's got property, uh, preferably with a building that's saying, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll make this available to you. Um, so that's a big challenge. So what we're looking for is, is a, a property that does not have what I'll call sensitive neighbors. Like it's, we don't want something that's in a residential neighborhood or has a school or a, a daycare or a place of worship nearby. So we found that sort of a mixed business park industrial area actually works pretty well for us. Um, a rural community actually, or a rural setting might work as well, but it's very isolated and doesn't have access to transit or walkable services and those type of things. So we're looking at a lot of different uh, options now, but our, uh, the biggest stumbling block really is filing, finding that willing landlord somebody like Iran that's saying, yeah, my property is available. Um, so, so yeah, it's very timely that question comes up now. Be awesome if the region could help in that way somehow too, eh? Um, I'm all about, hey, you never know, you could expropriate something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm radical that way. That does not mean that my opinions are shared by any of my colleagues. I just want you all to know that. Yeah. So I will say that the, the municipalities are being helpful to us in, okay. in their own way, the region and the city. And, and we haven't eliminated the possibility of, of a municipal property as the host site for a better tent city or, or for some kind of a supported encampment. But I don't think that's going to happen quickly. Um, and so, you know, we're going to have to leave Ardell Place in a few months. Uh, so I think it's up to us to find a property. But it may be that in a year or two or, or, or a few, in, a, in a short while um, that the municipalities maybe are able to come up with something that, that's a, a more permanent site. It would be wonderful to figure out a way to build that neighborhood so that there is that, or, that organic growth uh, that, uh, that doesn't become too institutionalized but allows for those essential services and, and that wonderful interchange, right, of the healing services and all of those things kind of coming together in a great way. That's what I loved about Ron's building, actually, because it, it's practically a community center in itself. Like, it was amazing, right? And um, the hardest thing is to go, oh, we'll never get that again or see that again, you know? And it's like, mm, with Ron is the kind of person that would never say never. I'm the kind of person who goes, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I just always want to keep it open, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who's next? Okay. He asked me to facilitate this. <laughs> <laughs> um, just just looking at the time, Heather. It's uh, yeah. Oh, it's eleven thirty-three. Yeah. There are some more oh. questions, but I'm I've made note of them all, and we'll make sure. They get asked uh, this afternoon if you want to close things off here at this point. I was going to say that, yeah, for anybody who has questions that we haven't answered yet, we are going to be having another panel discussion. Uh, and it's going to be slightly different. It's going to be about uh, lived experience as expert knowledge, but we're going to have uh, Better Tent City.
folks back during that time. Um, if there are any questions that, uh, that uh, Jeff or Laura or even Alvin could answer, then we will somehow in our follow-up make sure that there, that conversation can happen. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to stay, I think we could go another five minutes. And then after that, we probably have to close off because I promised people they could eat lunch. Um, and Laura has to drive over to, uh, to, to a better tent city so we can all do lunch with Laura. Um, so yeah. Uh, so I'd say, can, can we all do one more question? One or two? And I'll be quiet. Okay. This is a question about um, actual use of the units. Uh, is, are there cases when more than one person per unit is allowed, for example, a person and a partner? And um, how much time do people spend in these homes? Uh, so the couples stay together and uh, the people who are single, like people get to get the house for themselves or if they have a couple, if they're a couple, they can live together. Well, we just let people do whatever they choose to do. And a couple people have shared with someone else from here. It's up to them. It's their house and they do what they want. We just don't police people like that. Great. I have to ask my own question. Dogs? <laughs> dogs? Do you get dogs? dogs? Yeah, like we have two dogs here at the moment and three cats. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. They're family, yeah. members. And the, family members, right? And yeah. the cats and dogs, like the cats and dogs play together. It's, it's weird. Cats and dogs can get along. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Okay, yeah. moving away a bit from the living conditions to something a bit more formal. Um, are there any plans for a better tent city to become a registered charity itself rather than to be reliant on social development center as a host? I'm not sure yet. Jeff will answer that question. So I would say no. Um, we are a project, not an organization. And we may be a project that's up for adoption by another organization, but, um, but uh, no, we, we feel it's actually working pretty well being organic and not having a board of directors or an auditor and all those things that we can leave those to others and we can just focus on the work, the the day-to-day. -day. I think that's kind of in the spirit of Ron Doyle as well. Just get it done. Don't make it too organized. Don't get bogged down with rules and regulations. Um, because structure like that also comes with rules and expectations. And so I think the, the magic of a better tent city is that it lives outside of all those kind of controls. I, I couldn't agree more. And... Um... But I do have to say it couldn't have gotten off the ground were it not and couldn't be maintained without the support of Social Development Center. And um, just to be clear, Social Development Center does all of their support uh, right now. They, have, they, they just donate all of that time and energy. And I know it's massive. And so um, before we go too much further, I just want to say thank you uh, to the Social Development Center for taking that on uh, at the beginning. We, uh, needed a charitable partner and we had about three days to, to sew it up and the board unanimously said, this really matters, we just have to do it, even though there were so many questions. And, uh, and without that initial push and, and you know, charitable partner, we couldn't have moved forward. And since then, um, the Social Development Center has been super helpful with respect to community connections, tying us into the um, Unsheltered campaign, so much advocacy and good work uh, coming from their support. So, um, so yeah, thank you. Yes, I, I echo that. Thank you. I think that's the perfect way to end our session. Um, I really want to thank you guys for coming today and for uh, being willing to try our experiment. Um, thanks a lot, Jeff. I know you're really busy. You're welcome. So we can. You're very welcome. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. You're um, most welcome. So up next, uh, everybody can take a break. We're going to be back at a better tent city on location with Laura, where she's going to be cooking and talking all at the same time because she has talent. And um, and as we speak there, uh, if you want to donate $100 for a homeless meal, we're on it. 
Uh, you can donate at sdwrwaterlooregion.org uh, and we'll put up a slide about that. It's the best deal in town because you could have somebody come visit you and give you uh, an example of some of the things that people are handing out and they cook beautiful things, but they also give things like peanut butter sandwiches when that's what we've got. And uh, so they will come and talk with you a little bit about what they do. And that was uh, a desire to move through the screen and see some people. So we have a few folks that have donated, but didn't they weren't available to have uh, anything delivered. So we've done surrogate deliveries. So with the, uh, with the folks that are preparing right now, um, you may see them around town trying to find certain people to be able to deliver them lunch. So um, Nadine actually and Alvin are two of our deliverers as Lot 42 going mobile. And we have some unsheltered people. They've gotten everything ready. They've been in the kitchen doing whatever they can down at uh, 23 Water Street and they'll be on their way and they're gonna have cameras. So we may break away during our sessions with Laura. Um, also, I wanna, I wanna let you know that we are going to have a special video from 1.30 to two. If you're not busy and you just wanna play it while you're uh, doing your work or whatever, by all means, it's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful memorial for uh, a man who, was amazing. He would build tiny houses using uh, in in large um, semis, semi tractors. So it's a beautiful story by his daughter, and she has been working with the social development center since uh, September. So you're invited to come back. Uh, anybody who has a link, you should be able to link back on, and we will be on the air. But it wasn't part of the regular schedule. That's it. We'll see you later. Hi. You all in an hour. <laughs> in an hour. Okay. An hour? Okay. Yeah. Nadine, I'll see you in about 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go make my rounds, check on everyone. Excellent. Okay. And uh, to all yeah. of the attendees, please come back if you can. And uh, hopefully we'll see you later. If you can't return, I hope you have an absolutely fantastic day. And I hope that this was enlightening and interesting. And I hope you've learned a lot more about the experiment of a better tent city. Chi and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and now I have to figure out how do I go back to just having practice sessions or no, I have to stay on the air, which means I mute. <laughs> See, I'm learning, everybody. <laughs> and Fariel takes over with the slide. Hey, Nadine. Yeah. I'll be there real soon. Could you, um, when you're doing rounds, see if Paul or Rick or anybody can help me for a little bit in the kitchen? I thought I'd have yeah. more time to set up. I just need people to do stuff like wash the grapes and, you know, and, I, and I've got, you know, treats and yummy things, but I need okay. to. Thank you so much. Pick up a meal. Yeah. You and Elvis yes. deliver. So, so Nadine, are you um, heading here to pick? Uh,